seized and a better world has to be built. What's the point? The general strike where they blocked the, the road to the airport for a day and a half. Right. So that nobody can exactly. talk. Exactly. Like, that's stuff that you never hear what, anybody you, talking about. Or, and if, they, if you do hear it, they kind of gloss over it, right? And so I think... Th th the spirit of activism has been essentially killed here in the Bahamas when in actuality I think it was alive and well. I mean, we don't teach our young people about Garveyism, we don't teach our young women about feminism, right? And so when a, when a law, for example, that would outlaw marital rape is proposed, right. you have people saying, well, I don't understand, this is, this, this, that's my husband, he could do whatever to me that, I, that he wants to. But see, that's the thing, the reason why, and I could be wrong, but then mm -hmm. again, this is, my, this is an opinion. Right? My opinion is that the reason why we are afraid to, to teach person stuff like Garveyism mm -hmm. and to teach young women feminism, actual feminism, mm -hmm. not I can buy my own drink. Mm -hmm. That's not feminism, but that's what we've been teaching them. Beyonce feminism. feminism. Right, not Beyonce Independent feminism. women feminism. Yeah, yeah, but actual feminism. Yeah, yeah. Because we're afraid that if we teach them Garveyism, they're all going to become Rastafarians, and if we teach them feminism, they're mm -hmm. all going to become lesbians. Yeah, that's right. But like that, I don't... I don't think that's exactly what's going to happen. No, I think you give you you give young people and, and Bahamians the tools to kind of sort through the foolishness that they're being given. I mean, I was surprised that, I, and I shouldn't have been, because my first interaction with feminism was when I went off to school. So when I introduced it to my class here at COB, there was a lengthy kind of you know discussion about what this actually means right. and, se and, a, and a need to separate it from the myths that kind of accompany feminism in conservative spaces. Memorization just doesn't cut it. When you live in a world with protean and diverse flows of information and people who are not so much concerned about your well-being as well, you're going to need to have the kind of mental capacity right. to sort through right, what is going on around you. right? And if, if you can't look at it, find evidence, research it, and come to some kind of conclusion about it, then you are not a political animal. You are barely a citizen. Right, I took my um, my uh, I, I carry around the Constitution with me as a little booklet, a uh, yeah. Constitution. I took it in class, and I was like, "How many of you people know None. what this is?" None. I said, "This, these are the rules to the clubhouse. Right, we are in a clubhouse as citizens, and these are the rules. They conduct the authority of this clubhouse and how you should conduct yourself as well. And we have no idea what those rules are. It may be a matter that young persons are, and it could be like how we spoke about earlier that you mm -hmm. just feel." What's the point? Mm -hmm. I, like, uh, government doesn't work. Nobody's going to listen to you. But it could be the point that young persons feel something similar to that, where we know certain things are illegal mm -hmm. in the country, right? For example, it's uh, apparently it's illegal for you to have a lottery in the Bahamas <laughs> because, like, apparently there's a whole law in it. Yeah. Right? yeah. Like, but certain people yeah, are unaware yeah. of that, yeah. right? And so it's like, if young persons know that this is illegal. And yet they see these places are fully established, they set up shop, mm -hmm. they have wonderful signs and banners everywhere, and then nobody is doing anything. Nobody, who, who has the authority to stop them, who's mm -hmm. supposed to be carrying out the law, stopping them? Then it's like, what's the point of me, first of all, trying to decipher the Constitution? If the persons who are the caretakers of it, mm. the writers of it, right. have no regard for right. it themselves, right. have no regard for the law. If you don't feel like anything can change in this country, if you don't feel like nothing nothing matters, if you, if you feel like any kind of action won't result in any kind of uh, um, um, you know, answer to the questions you're posing to your government, yes. then you won't care about reading the Constitution. And I think one of the things that we have to do is kind of break this discourse around um, why inaction is better than action here in the country, why um, nothing will change here in the country. And I think that kind of discourse is an idealist discourse, it's a progressive discourse, and those voices in this country are not heard. We've not been taught a history of persons where action, however long it took or how much fight it took, actually resulted in anything. Sometimes like we look at, we look at history and what we see is, all right, in 1967, majority rule, and then 1970, no, well, majority rule. Yeah, 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 no, right? no, yeah. Yeah, 1967 majority rule, 1973 independence, uh -huh. and then whatever else happened in that 40 years that we're not really clear about or whatever, because we don't really focus on right. too much on the details. Yeah, yeah. But there are things that happened that led up to those things. The, you had the whole, um, when Cindy Poitier, he had a movie coming out, and nobody wanted the, well, the white oligarchy was like, that movie's not coming to the Bahamas because uh -huh. it give these colored people the wrong idea. 
right? And so the people formed the Citizens Committee, and they're like, mm -hmm. we need to see this film. This film needs to come yeah. out. And you have this peaceful action and this mm -hmm. demonstration, and it, it was an actual, it was a political thing. Right. And it helped to start the whole movement mm -hmm. for majority rule mm -hmm. and all that stuff. But, and like, there, are there, there are tons of other things that yeah. happen, but we don't know about we this know. history. We, we, My we, job was political work in Washington, D.C., and then I went to, to London and I was involved in the student protests there, you know, the millions of people who came out on the streets. Um, and it was quite interesting, some of the messages that I got. Why are you out there? It's too dangerous. Or, um, see them crazy people over there in Europe and Greece right now. A lot of people will say, see them crazy people in Greece. What are they doing? They, you know, get out of the streets, behave yourselves. There is, um, we can look at people elsewhere and see them doing this stuff. But I don't think we know that Bahamians can do the, the very same thing. Right. And, I, and I think that that is, that is, that is a problem. If we don't have those kind of historical markers or models or those benchmarks to say that we've made particular strides because of organization and advocacy and action, then you know people won't be able to participate in real political action. They, they just don't see themselves in that kind of a movement. And and what we need to do is endeavor to change that. Our rulers are on on Bay Street, and so every time there's a a, a demonstration. It needs to happen on Bay Street, mm -hmm. right? And the problem is, we've been taught by the system that we rely on the foreigners so much that we have to force ourselves right. to behave in front yes. of them. And so it is, it is wrong for you to act up mm -hmm. in, in front, front of, of the white people. Yeah. Well, I mean, in front the, of the yeah, tourists. But, but the, nobody the, cares about no. African American tourists, right. and we don't want to be honest. Right. That's that's one thing. But the other thing is this, right? There is a certain kind of middle classing of politics here in the Bahamas, and I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna do like a little bit of a historical trajectory. If you read kind of Gail Saunders' work on like class relations in the Bahamas prior to independence. Uh, what you'll realize is that colored middle class Bahamians wanted nothing to do with these black working class Bahamians right, and wanted to themselves. right and wanted to kind of matriculate as best as possible to the upper classes, right? So from that and in, in, in each part of the diaspora wherever this happens, right? There is this kind of politics of respectability that we can't shake, right? right. And it goes it's it's everything from you getting out of the streets and acting out. One of my students said well, if they're not listening to you and when you speak, then what do you do? I said, stand up and break something, right? And they're like, oh, why would we, you know, why would we do that? You have to break something. This, and this politics of respectability, I think, goes from political action even to appearance, right? right. So people will look at me. You want to become like yes, the rulers. Of course. They would, people, most people would prefer me in a suit, no piercings, clean cut, right? right. And they tell me that, quite frankly. Um, people assume certain things about me within this context. And they'll say, I remember when you were a respectable boy, when you were head boy, free board. I remember when you were a, a respectable boy. Right. And all of this, the piercings, the tattoos, the dreadlocks, all that stuff, kind of disturbs their idea of what it is to be respectable. To be respectable. And then I speak, or they see my resume, and they're like, those two things don't match up because there's no way this disrespectful looking boy right. could have a kind of resume or whatever it is that people might admire. Um, and I think we have to begin to break that politics of respectability and show people that um, Bahamian and Bahamians and political action and all of these things cannot be beholden to this middle classing of our culture and it can't be beholden to a middle classing of our politics. It cannot be beholden to this middle classing because by virtue of it coming from a, a history of middle classism, it also comes from our colonial history, right. and they are intricately tied together. And unless we break those things, then we're just spinning our wheels. Um, it may not have been particularly thought out, but now you can ride from our wealthy enclaves in the west to our wealthy enclaves in the east without ever having to go through the middle of Nassau anymore, right? Well, that was and, thought out. And we'll see, I, people keep telling me that wasn't thought out that way, yeah? so I'm going to give people the benefit of the doubt. But what's important to note about that is that similarly how class is separated right. in kind of these distinct so socioeconomic ways. Geographically, uh, those of us who are in the middle class, and I'm including myself in this because I live out west, those of us get to um, stay in our little bubbles, right. right? On either east where the old money is or west where the new money is. I'm not from NASA, this is what people tell me. <laughs> um, and we don't ever have to interact with the people who our policy often affects the most. And those are the people in the middle of Nassau right. who, you know, who are, are act stuck. who are stuck and suffering. Right, and it's like they're outsiders stuck on the inside. Side, yes, yeah. and in the inside of a vacuum. Right, the beauty that 
we see on a tourism pamphlet mm -hmm. that we sell to persons and that some of us in the middle class get to enjoy, that is not their, it seems that we've taken away it as their right. Mm -hmm. It's like this giant metaphor where it's like, oh, you know what the Bahamas is, sun, sand, and sea. Mm -hmm. You don't live in sun, sand, and sea. You live in Camp Road. Where the, or you live in Bantam, right. or you live, even at this point, God knows. Mm -hmm. I live, mean, it's that, it's that, fan, it's that France, it's that, France Fanonian thing, right? Where he says in Wretched of the Earth, you know, um, the colony is always Manichaean in, in, its in its organization. In other words, it's split very clearly between the have and the have nots, the, the, the black village and, and the white city. And those two things are very clearly demarcated. I think the lines have been blurred a little bit, as, you know, as time has gone on. But Fanon is prophetic in that. He also says that our elite bourgeoisie, those people who come to power after independence, will continue to operate within the same economic legacy as colonialism. And so those of us who are living in the, in the, in the, black, in the black slave quarters will continue to serve um, um, the, the foreigners, but in, in a way that is, it seems more acceptable. Um, Paradise Island is, 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 is an example of that. Right, and if you want, it, if you want like the full story, you can just read Animal Farm. Yeah, you can read Animal like Farm. The the but I, I always say everybody should read Franz Fanon's Wretched of the Earth because I, I, I think it's prophetic. In, no, in, it's in not that, that it's yeah. not, it's just like, yeah. give them a narrative. Let's right, start, yes, let's yes. start yes. off simple. Let's yeah, start okay. off with Animal okay. Farm and Squealer okay. and Napoleon. Yes. yes. You know, and like, or yeah. Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> read the plot summary. Right, uh huh. It's, it's close enough. Mm -hmm. Okay. The question then is, because a lot of Bahamians, even though we may not say, we may not use words like nepotism and all these different things, mm -hmm. we understand these concepts on some level. And even though we may not quote France or not, we, yeah. may, we may understand that the politicians seem to be serving themselves. They have their own interests at heart. But why are we so blind? Why, are we, why do we still blindly trust our leaders? Because there are, let, let's just say, plumbers, Garbage men, phone card vendors have higher standards, are mm -hmm. held to higher standards than politicians. Mm -hmm. But every five years, Bahamians still vote in the exact same type of person. It's like, why do we blindly trust these people? I, I uh, to be completely honest, I don't know if it's trust at all. I don't know many Bahamians who trust the politicians that they vote for. Perhaps it's just my circle of uh, my social circle. Right. I, I was I was in London at the time of the elections, but I, I saw some of the rallies streaming um, um, live, and it did look a little bit like church in the same way that you know people are trying to trust pastor right. to tell them exactly what's going on with the word of God. Um, I think part of it has to do with what we were talking about at the beginning, which is that they just believe the way this is the way things are. Um, but I also think that there's a, there's a history of, of paternalism and dependence when it comes to Bahamian politics um, back to the 1920s. You know, even even as we were approaching majority rule, um, if you read um, Colin Hughes's work on on race and politics in the Bahamas, mm -hmm. there's a quote from a black lady in there. I, this is prior to 1967. Um, where she says, "Lord knows, I wanted to vote for um, for the for the for the black men. Y'all have." Um, she's talking to the PLP, right. but those white boys speak so pretty, and they talk so they they look so so good, right? And 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 if you if you read the history, what you'll realize is that you know these these um, politicians were giving out bags of sugar right. and flour. And people could depend on them around election time to take care of them. In the same way that today, perhaps, and so I've heard, I wasn't here for it, but in the same way you may get past a, a t-shirt full of, of cash or, uh, or, or, you know, you would get free Trevento at your, your political, <laughs> you get free Trevento at your political, at the politi your, your favorite um, political party's rally. I, right. I, I, I mean, I think one of the things that we have to do, though, is we have to engage the university, the College of the Bahamas, with all its talent, right, in there, because there's a lot of talent at the College of the Bahamas, to kind of parse through these issues and sort this stuff out. These are sociological questions, these are also psychological questions, and I think if we were to, if, if the college were to engage in the community, as I think universities should, then I think we can begin to kind of answer, at least begin to find, find out what are the first steps in kind of dealing with the way that we think about politics here at home? I definitely think it's a kind of paternalism, though, and a dependency that I think is, in the end, a little bit poisonous for us. A lot poisonous, actually. Yeah, and, and the whole idea <clears throat> that instead of trying to, I guess, not, not like approach the system mm. or change the system, we're actually just perpetuating it. Yeah. 
I mean, and for a lot of our most vocal leaders, let's take for example, who gets to speak the most in the newspapers here at home, right? It's either the politicians or the pastors, right? right. Changing this system does damage to the way that they can operate within, within this, the Bahamian social context. Changing this is, you know, tantamount to taking away in, 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 in a very real way their, their power, social and political power. If we were to change it in the way that I think it should be changed. Those people who get to speak the most, who are listened to the most, pro will likely not encourage you and I and everybody else in the Bahamas to make a step and change the system as it is. Okay. Just man, it's